Um, we're ready to begin. This week's Torah portion is Kitisa, Kisisa. And if you're in the blue, ask our comments. You can find it on page 484. So just that you know, the highlight or the low light, I should say, of this week's Torah portion is the golden calf. We'll get to that famous story momentarily. But let's begin with the opening commandment of this week's Torah portion that has nothing to do with the golden calf, but it's rather the mitzvah of machatzit ha-shekel, the half shekel. So we know that when the Jewish people built the Mishkan, which we've been studying for the past few weeks, the tabernacle, they were commanded that every Jew should give a half shekel. Now, in addition of the half shekel being appropriated for the sockets of the uh, the foundation of the Mishkan or for the daily sacrifices, there was another purpose. And this is something that we still practice till today. If you've ever been in a shul and they're looking for a minion and they want to count if there's a minion, uh, the traditional way to do it is by reciting a verse that has 10 words. The verse is from the book of Psalms. It says, Hoshia et amecho varech et nachlatecho urein venasim ad ha'olam. It's a lovely passage from the book of Psalms where King David says, save your nation, bless your inheritance or your lot, your heritage, the Jewish people. Ureim, raise them up, v'nasem, and lead them forever. So since there are 10 words, we go, Shia Asamecha, and we count by using the words of the passage. If you're not familiar with that passage, you can say, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lacha Min Haaretz. The, bread, the blessing over bread also has 10 words to it. Now, why don't we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? It's because we are not allowed to count people by their heads. And we find it in the beginning of this week's Torah portion. Hashem says to Moshe, when you raise up, when you elevate the heads of the children of Israel, according to their numbers, every person shall give a half a shekel, and you will count the half shekels, and you will know how many people there are. So we know countries conduct census to know how many citizens they have. This was a census. But it was a very unique, one-of-a-kind census. And that was everyone made a contribution, and you counted the contributions as a half shekels, and you knew how many Jews there were. Now, a number of questions come to mind. The first question is, why? Why can't you just count one, two, three? Why does everyone have to make a contribution? Second question is, if they're going to make a contribution, why a half a shekel? It's like saying everyone should give a half a dollar. Why not give a whole dollar and count how many dollars there are? Why a half a shekel versus a whole shekel? And the key to these questions is in the third question. The name of the Torah portion, which is the second verse of the Torah, God spoke to Moses saying, Ki tisa, when you raise up the heads of the children of Israel, you should do it by their numbers, by everyone giving a half a shekel. Now, it should have said, when you count, ki tispor, tispor means to count. When you count the children of Israel, let everyone give a half a shekel and count a half shekels. What does it mean when you raise up? And here's the answer. The answer is that counting could be an elevation or in a way it could be a form of degradation. What do I mean? When typically when you count, um, when you count, objects, items, they typically are things that are relegated to a number because they don't have individual unique value unto itself. So you say there's a dozen eggs, right? It's not about each individual egg. It's a dozen. It's a collective, right? The same thing is true with statistics, by the way, when people say, well, you know, 2% of people get this illness, God forbid. Well, what they're saying is, since it's only 2%, maybe we don't have to put so much medical research there. If 30% of the population are affected by something, then maybe we want to allocate funds. But if it's only 2%, it's a statistic 2%. But those 2% are real people with real lives and real stories. Every one of us has a name. Our name is our individuality, who we are. 
there's only one of a kind. And the truth is your name is not your true reflection. Because let's say you have a name, Nancy or David or Jack. There's millions of Jacks and millions of Nancys and millions of Davids. And if you say, well, I have a last name, I'm Jack Goldberg. Well, guess what? There's lots of Jack Goldbergs too. So even your name is not who you uniquely are. But surely a number, I say there's 100 people in the room. It's not about the individual. It's just like the total number is 100 people in the room. To give you a horrible example, think about the Nazis. They took the Jews and they gave them tattoos with a number in the concentration camp. And that was the most dehumanizing thing, because in effect, what they were saying is, you are just a number here. You're not a person. You have no identity. We don't care about you. You're just like, here's your barcode, you know, like a product in the store, and you're just an item. You're a passive um, object, not a subject. God forbid, when you go to prison, to visit someone, or if God forbid someone's incarcerated. I, I just happened to have been in prison yesterday visiting someone. And sadly, what they do in prison is they take away your name, your inmate number, this, that, and the other, right? And when they call you, they don't even call you by your name. They don't say on the speaker, you know, you know, Jack or whatever the last name is, come to the front desk or whatever. They say inmate number 476, whatever. When you write a letter to a person in jail, God forbid, you know, you got to put their inmate number, right? And, and by the way, today in modern times, a lot of times you call customer service for something or whatever. And they say, well, what's your PIN number or what's your social security number, right? So we also use numbers to identify people. What's your telephone number, right? You know, they they find you in the system by your telephone number, right? Well, sometimes they ask for your date of birth. At least it's something unique to you. But a random number has nothing to do with who you are. So the usage of numbers, of, uh, of, of chalking people up or um, relegating people to just numbers could be dehumanizing and devaluing of who they truly are. So therefore the Torah doesn't say when you count the children of Israel, it says when you raise up the children of Israel. In other words, what God is saying is make sure that this counting is not a, the, the, the debilitating, uh, degradating form of a signage that you're just a, a, a number, but rather an elevation. Now, how do you elevate a person by counting them? When you say to them, we're not just counting you to know a statistical number. We're counting you because you count, because you matter. Even though there may be, you know, millions of Jews, but you are unique and we need you to be counted. Why do we need you to be counted? So here you come to the next point, because you're going to make a contribution. Everyone should make a contribution and be counted by their contributions. In other words, saying that we need your contribution. Everyone has their contribution that they can make. And even if you say, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. And the answer is you may only be a half. You may be incomplete. You may not be able to get the job done yourself, but your half and my half and everyone's half together will accumulate. And that's, when you think about psychologically, a lot of times people are not motivated to take action because they feel I'm insignificant. I can't do anything. I'm powerless. I'm a nobody. And the Torah says, no, your contribution matters. You could have an impact. And you may think it's very small. I'm only giving a half a shekel. But your half shekel will combine with someone else's half shekel. Your actions, your efforts will meet with someone else's efforts. And collectively, we will get the sum. We will get the results. We will get the outcome achieved, the goal. And that's the message of counting. And that's why till today, when we go into a synagogue or any situation, we don't count by numbers, we only by individuals. I remember once hearing a story about this woman who had a lot of kids, I don't know, 12, 14, 16. And someone said, how many children do you have? Now, a lot of times people are reluctant to say how many they have because it's like an ayin hara. They don't want to use the number. But they'll say, so this one woman said, someone said, how many children do you have? She had like 15 kids. How many kids do you have? And she said, I have one of each kind. And that's the whole idea of counting by the contributions. To take it one step further, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says the following. He says, the verse says, let everyone give according to their numbers, 
every man shall give an atonement for his soul. So there will not be a plague amongst them when counting them. Now, literally, it means that if you count by numbers, it could bring a plague, meaning it's a sin. You shouldn't count that way, and it could bring a negative punishment result. But Rabbi Sachs says the following, and this is so true as well. He said that if you look at the story of the Jewish people, we've always been in the tiniest, smallest of all nations. So sometimes if you look at your numbers of the Jewish people, you could feel very insignificant. You know, what are we going to do? We're 15 million Jews. We're up against, you know, over a billion Muslims and 2 billion Christians. And how could we ever prevail and succeed in this world with so many enemies, let's say, right? So Rabbi Sachs says something very beautiful. He says that what God is saying to the Jewish people, if you don't want that there should be a negative perspective, outcome, conclusion, feeling, plague, psychologically amongst the Jewish people, feeling powerless and outnumbered by so many others, don't count Jews by their head. Because if you count Jews by their head, the number is 14 million, 15 million, 16 million. It's less than a quarter of 1% of the world's population. But rather, tell every Jew to contribute and count their contributions. When you look at the contribute, if you measure the Jewish people not by their numbers of members of the Jewish faith, of the Jewish religion, of the Jewish people, but you measure them by their contributions, you have a whole different number. You have a whole different calculation and tally. You know, it's not uncommon for people to be surprised when they hear that there's only 15 million Jews. They think, what? I thought there's hundreds of millions. I thought, right? Why is there this common misconception that Jews are so large? Because people look at the impact of Jews, the roles that Jews play in the world, the influence that Jews have had. I mean, think about the most famous people of the 20th century, you know. Think about Albert Einstein. Think about Sigmund Freud. Think about all these great Jews who transformed the way we live. And when you look at, you know, Nobel Prizes, people always talk about 20, 30 percent of Nobel Prizes are won by Jews, even though we're less than one quarter of one percent of the population was 0.2. So, again, if you count the numbers, we're tiny. If you look at the contributions, we are very significant. So don't the message is that you can't be counted by his number of how many members there are, but by their contributions. And that's a good message in general that. What does it mean to be counted, to be a part of a group? To be a part of a group doesn't just mean you exist. You know, I'm a member. I belong. I'm a part of. Yes, that's a good start. You're a member of the Jewish people. You're a part of the Jewish nation. By all means, you should be proud of it. But the real question is, my number, my presence, my being counted amongst the Jewish people, not so much am I being counted amongst the Jewish people or... Can I be counted upon to do my part as a Jew? What is my contribution? And never feel when I'm so small and insignificant. That's what the Torah deliberately says. Everyone should give a half a shekel. And here's a deeper point. The Torah goes on to say, the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less. Why? Generally, the more you have, the more you're expected to give. And the answer is because in one aspect, the Torah is saying is we're all equal, the rich and the poor. Why? Because the rich and the poor may give different amounts. But they both have the choice to give it with the same intentionality, the, the same devotion of the heart, the same love and generosity. And therefore, the rich and the poor can give different amounts, but really they're both giving half of the same shekel because both are giving it with the same uh, love and devotion to Hashem. And therefore, the measure is not only by what the rich man has versus the poor man, but the way they give it, the way they do it. And the idea is that whatever your capacity is in any realm, not just money, obviously, in any realm, if your contribution is, and that brings us to the next point, it says, this is what they shall give. Now, whenever you say this, it means you're pointing at something. So Rabbi say, why does it say, this is what they shall give? Who's pointing to what? So our rabbis tell us that Moses didn't know what is this half a shekel. So Rashi quotes it right here from the Midrash. God showed him a coin of fire that weighed a half a shekel and said, this is the amount, this is the coin that they should give. 
Now, whenever, whenever God has to step in and point something out, there has to be a reason to it. The question is, why did God have to point out what the coin was? And a rabbi say, Moses didn't understand. How could giving a half a coin be an atonement for your sins? And God says it's a fiery coin. It's the fire that's associated with the given. It's the passion. It's the love. It's the feeling that accompanies the giving of the half a shekel that makes the half a shekel an atonement for your sins. So more than our actions, actions obviously are so important, but we also have to realize that we all have the capacity to uh, to give on the same level if we're coming from the same devotion uh, as 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 whatever anyone else is achieving if I'm doing whatever is within my means to the best of my ability. So that is the opening commandment that is the half shekel. The next subject, before we even get to the subject of the golden calf, is the story of the wash basin. And there's a lot to be said about this. We know that the Kohen, when he went into the Holy Temple, the first thing he did was he washed his hands from a copper la la laver. He actually washed his feet as well. And, you know, today we don't have a holy temple. We don't have Kohanim serving in the temple. We have honor honorary, um, we have honorary um, Kohanim who get the first Aliyah, the Kohen Aliyah, and so on and so forth. However, in a sense, all Jews are Kohanim today. Why are we all Kohanim in a sense? Because we all are considered a kingdom, a nation of Kohanim. We have to serve mankind. And therefore, we all do, in certain respects, the service of the Kohanim. The best example or the first example is every morning. What does a Jew when he, do when he wakes up? He says the Modani, and then he washes his hands and says the blessing, al natilat yadayim. Now, if you notice, you don't wash your hands by running your hands on the water with soap. You take a cup and you pour three times or one, two, three, four, five, six when you wake up in the morning. For bread, you go one, two, three, one, two, three. For natilat in the morning, one, two, three, four. Why do we do it in this fashion? And the answer is because that's what the Kohen did when he began his daily service. And so you're getting up in the morning and on a deeper level, you're not just getting up to go to work. You're getting up to fulfill your service of God in this world. Our day should be seen as a service of Hashem to serve God's purposes in this world through my actions, through my deeds, through my mitzvot that I'm going to perform today, or even through my work, because my work is a service of God. I need to work to support my family, to live in this world, to fulfill my mission and purpose. So we do what the Kohen did at the beginning of his daily service, which is wash his hands. So we are acting as Kohanim when we begin our daily service. To show you how far this idea of Kohanim goes, Every day in the morning blessings, we say a blessing on the commandment to study Torah. Just like there's a blessing on other mitzvot, there's a blessing on the commandment to study Torah. And then to make sure that we actually study Torah, because the day could pass without any Torah study, and then it's a blessing in vain. You know what we do? We study a few passages of Torah. Which passage of Torah do we study? We say three verses. May God bless you and protect you. Ya'er Hashem God should shine his countenance, the priestly blessing. Why do we say those passages from all the passages? And maybe it's to remind us we are the Kohanim. We have to be a blessing unto the world, a blessing unto humanity, a blessing unto others during the course of the day. So when we say the blessing for Torah study, we quote the verses about the priestly blessing because we're all Kohanim every day of our lives. Friday night, when we bless our children, we all become Kohanim. We bless our children with the priestly blessing. And there are many examples. You know, the woman lights the Shabbat candles before Shabbat. That's like the Kohen lighting the candelabra in the temple. When we finish Shabbat, we smell the spices. That's like the incense, which we're going to read about here as well. So we incorporate elements of the Kohen's duty. And that's the washing of the hands daily. Now, there's a lot more to this uh, washing of the hands. Um... And the, and the feet, as I mentioned to you. And that is that there's a famous uh, Midrash that says that 
the women, we're going to learn this later in the Torah, in a few weeks from now, in Vayakel, that the, the laver basin of the washing of the Kohen Gadol was made from the mirrors of the Jewish women. Why would, it? and Moses didn't want to accept it at first. He said, I'm not accepting mirrors. Mirrors is an object of vanity. And God said, that's the most precious one to me. Why? Because the women would beautify themselves with these mirrors in order to attract their husbands to procreate with them and have, have a family, have children with them. Because they didn't want to, the men were in slavery and they didn't want to have children. They thought, what's the point of raising the next generation of slaves in Egypt? But the women had faith that they were going to go free. And therefore they insisted on having children and they enticed their husbands with the mirrors and engaged them in intimacy and were able to procreate. And God said, these mirrors are the most precious because they were used for a holy purpose. And once again, showing us the idea over and over in Judaism, and you could look at a mirror like an object of vanity, but it's not. It could be used for the holiest, most sacred purposes. Everything could be used for a higher purpose. And that's the message of the wash basin being made out of the copper mirrors, the shiny mirrors that the women used in order to uh, entice their men to have children with them. So before we get to the golden calf, another major subject of this week's Torah portion, of course, uh, is the spices that were used for the incense. There was a golden altar in the temple that they brought incense on it, a beautiful aroma and fragrance. It says the fragrance of the holy temple went till Jericho in the times of the temple. It could be smelled far and wide. We all know today that the fragrance business is not just a big business for perfume, but actually... A lot of businesses and companies where when you walk in, there's a fragrance that they pump into the air to create a certain atmosphere and a feeling and a, you know, whatever they're trying to convey. But the point is fragrance, nostrils and smell is very powerful. Uh, it's connected to the soul. It's not tangible, but the soul is inspired by it. That's why we have the spices at the end of Shabbat. So there was an aroma that was made from 11 very unique spices and Again, we won't get into all of it now, but just that you know, one of the spices uh, had a negative, uh, when I say a negative, I mean a bad, foul odor. The chelbana had a foul odor. But when it was mixed with all the other odors, all the other fragrances, it came out beautifully. And again, the message is that sometimes you have a person that may not be so righteous, but when they're put in an environment of other righteous people, they could become part of the community and they could transform into a beautiful fragrance. So an individual on their own may not omit the greatest fragrance, but when combined with other good fragrances, we all know there's something called peer pressure, but more than peer pressure, the influence of a community, of an environment, of a society could have an impact that could be transformative in the life of an individual. And one more point before we get to the golden cap, which I told you is the low point of this Torah portion, uh, the, the low light. Um, the artisans who designed the objects are mentioned here, starting with Bitzalel. Bitzalel means in the shadow of God. He was inspired to create this beautiful artwork. And the Torah says God, uh, God um, filled them up with a glorious spirit, a godly spirit, with wisdom, with insight, with knowledge, to design every craft, to weave designs, to work with gold, silver, copper, right? So when you see an artist who knows how to make sublime art, it's a divinely inspired gift of knowledge and inspiration to be able to achieve that. And the Torah refers to it as wisdom of the heart, and they will make all the vessels and fashion everything. I'll just tell you an interesting midrash that says, that uh, there was a debate between Moses and the artisans. The artisans said, Moses said, let's make the vessels of the temple and then we'll make the structure. And Betzalel, the artisan said to Moses, when you build a house, you don't build the furniture and then the house. First you build the house and then you make the furniture. First we build the walls and then we build the articles. The question is, what were they discussing? What were they arguing? Why would Moses think you start with the furniture first? Who goes and orders furniture for their house before they bought a house or built a house? And the answer is that Moses' perspective was the tabernacle is a shell. 
It's a covering. It's a framework for what? For what happens inside the tabernacle. What happens inside the tabernacle? The worship, the altar, the candelabra, the uh, the, the table, right? All the religious articles, the ark with the tablets. So he says, we'll start with what's essential. Then we'll talk about the secondary, which is the walls of the tabernacle. And while that's true, uh, that yes, the essence is what goes on inside the tabernacle, but you also need a structure. You also need a frame to 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 contain it. And therefore, the Tzal says, you're right. The main thing is the service and the worship in the temple. But without a mishkan, the walls of the tabernacle, you don't have uh, the container and the framework the structure to be able to bring about that uh, divine worship. So to use a, a practical example, right? Let's say you are a brilliant person and you have amazing ideas, right? And you want to, you know, share your ideas with the world, right? Because they're in your head and you want to share it with the world so the world could benefit from your amazing ideas, right? You need to do some very practical things. Uh, the first thing is you need a pen and paper or a typewriter or a computer in today's day. So you could write the manuscript. Then you have to go find a publisher who's going to buy the manuscript or take it to press. And then you need a publishing house. And then you need a distribution uh, company to get the book out to the mat, right? Now, you may say, well, that's not so important. I mean, the main thing is the ideas in my head. Uh, that I want to share. Yeah, you're right. The main thing is the ideas in your head that you want to share with the uh, world. But without the practical steps of a publishing house and a distribution company and a computer to write the book down, those books, that those inspiring ideas are not going to get transmitted to anyone. So in life, sometimes we want to like focus on what's essential, but we have to for, uh, realize that we also have to take the time to build and create what is going to be the vehicle for what's essential? I'll give you a practical example. You know, people who say, well, you know, let's say building a synagogue till today, right? People say, well, why do you need organized religion? You know, God is everywhere. And the answer is, yeah, God is everywhere. But we need the structure in order to facilitate that relationship with God. Now, it doesn't mean you can't worship God on the beach or, or, or walking in the woods. Of course you can. Sometimes you could do it more effectively from time to time. You should go off to a quiet place where you could connect with God. But on a day-to-day -day basis, in order to have a place for the community to come and worship, you need to organize a synagogue and a community and build a temple or a synagogue, right? So that's the practical steps. And that's what Betzalel said to Moshe, and Moshe agreed. One last thought before we get to the golden calf, and that is that the Torah talks about Shabbat. Just that you know, all the laws of Shabbat are derived from the Mishkan because God says, do not build the Mishkan on Shabbat. As holy as the Mishkan is, it does not override the holiness of Shabbat. The holiness of Shabbat is even greater than the holiness of the Mishkan. Holiness in time is greater than holiness in space. And therefore, you can't work on Shabbat. Like when we build our synagogue, we always tell the contractors, you can't work on Shabbat. If you have a, a contractor at your house, you can't work on Shabbat. But even for a synagogue, you're not allowed to build on Shabbat. So based on this, the rabbi said, okay, the Torah says don't do work on Shabbat. What is classified or defined as work? So there are 39 forms of labor that are forbidden on Shabbat. Why 39? Who came up with these 39? So what the rabbis did is they looked at all the laborers in the temple, in the Mishkan. And they said, since God said, you're not allowed to do these labors on Shabbat. That's the definition of what is labor. So there are what's called avot and tuldot. Literally means parents and children. What does that mean? 39 forms of labor are the parent categories. And each one has derivatives, so to speak, children that are from that category. And then there's other restrictions that uh, the rabbis put into place as well. Now we come to chapter 32 the story of the golden calf, okay? Now, something interesting you're going to see when you come to Shabbat. We know every Shabbat, the Torah portion is divided into seven aliyot, correct? Now, usually they're proportional, you know, give or take, some a little longer, some a little shorter, but 
roughly the same size. This week's Torah portion is not a small Torah portion. It has 139 verses. But at le- I would say at least 50% of the Torah portion are in the first two aliyot. Why are the first? So the first two aliyot are very long and the other ones are short. Why are the first two very long? And the answer is that the one who gets called up for the second aliyah, chapter 32, is a Levite, the second aliyah. The one tribe that didn't participate in the golden calf was the Levite tribe. As a matter of fact, Moses summons them to help him punish those people who made the golden calf. So they were the only tribe that was innocent of the sin of the golden calf. So we structured the Torah portion. If we made the first two aliyot shorter, then the one who gets called up for the third aliyah, the fourth aliyah, where the golden calf would be, would be a non-Levite. And he'd be reading about what his grandparents did and be embarrassed. So therefore, we stretch out the first two. So a Levite should be standing at the Torah with the honor of the golden calf story because he has nothing to be ashamed of. He has nothing to be embarrassed of. And this in itself is a very powerful lesson because it says that when somebody does Teshuvah, you're never allowed to remind them of what they did. So let's say somebody was once a sinner in one way or another, committed certain sins, and then they reformed, they changed their ways. You're never allowed to say, hey, you were once doing that yourself. Once they change, you can't bring it up. Well, here we are literally over 3,000 years after the sin of the golden calf, but we still don't want to embarrass someone whose ancestors 3,000 years ago participated in something sinful. So that's just an interesting idea. So I think everyone knows the story of the golden calf. We don't have to go over the actual story. But just to uh, quickly summarize before we try to focus on some insights, okay? The first thing is that what happened? So basically what happened was Moses went up to get the tablets, 40 days and 40 nights. The Jews see Kiboshesh Moshe Laredet Menaha. Moses is delayed. They miscalculated when the 40 days begin and end. They started counting the day he went up. So they thought he was coming down a day earlier. He wasn't coming down. A rabbi said the Satan, the prosecutory angel or the... The, the the angel that tries to cause the Jews to sin uh, showed an image in heaven like Moses being carried on a the bed. They thought Moses died. He's not coming back. And now they're stranded in the desert. You know, imagine your tour guide takes you out on a, to a, somewhere in Israel in a desert and says, I'll be back and doesn't come back. And now I'm like, how are we going to get out of here? You took us out of Egypt. Now you left us here. So what do they do? They panic. They panic. What do they do when they panic? They say, let's make a golden calf. Now, in my video today, if you didn't watch it, you could go watch it. I talked about how do they think a golden calf is going to be their leader? They were trying to replace Moses with a golden calf made out of jewelry. Okay, that's a separate subject. I won't, you know, the, I, I basically said the Kuzari said, they figured they, in the tabernacle, there was the cherubim, the voice of God came through that. God will the, uh, channel his... Uh, Instead of Moses being the leader, he will channel his divine presence through this golden calf. And they had certain powers, magic, whatever it may be. But what happens? Moses, God tells Moses in heaven, go down, descend. Your nation has sinned that you took out of Egypt. They made a golden calf. And Moses comes down and he sees the calf and he sees the people dancing and celebrating. And he smashes the tablets. Okay, we all know the story. Moses smashes the tablets. And basically, there's a lot of uh, aftermath to the story. First, he grinds the calf to dust, okay, before their eyes. And then he summons the tribe of Levites to bring retribution on the 3,000 people who were directly involved. And then he pleads for forgiveness from God. That's the general aftermath. And he effectuates this forgiveness. And not only that, but what we receive in this week's Torah portion is the 13 attributes of divine mercy. I think everyone knows the song. We sing it on the high holidays. Hashem, Hashem, Korachon, V'chanon, Erech, Apayim, Rav, Chesed, V'yemes, Notzah, Chesed, L'alofim, right? God, oh God. A compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in kindness and truth, preserve kindness for thousands of generations, right? Those 13 attributes of divine mercy were taught to Moses in this week's Torah portion, all in the aftermath of the golden calf. So before we get into so many details about the story, 
we have to look at how it actually happened. And the way it happened was Moses goes up, he's late, the Jews panic, they say, let's make a golden calf. Now, who was in charge while Moses was up in heaven? Aaron, his brother. He put Aaron in charge. And Aaron says to the people, okay, you want to make a golden calf? Bring your jewelry from your wives. They come back with the jewelry. And Aaron throws the jewelry into the fire. And he makes a golden calf. And not only that, this is shocking, Aaron saw and built an altar before him. And Aaron called out and said, a festival for Hashem tomorrow. And one of the big troubling questions, or very uh, universal questions about this story that's talked about in all the commentaries is, what was the role of Aaron in the golden calf? And is it really possible that Aaron was a participant, not even only a participant, an organizer. He tells them, go get the jewelry, let's make it. He builds an altar. He says, we're going to have a festival for God. What in the world is Aaron? How did Aaron, the high priest, participate in this? Like I said, he was the leader in charge. What's his culpability or his accountability for this? And what's shocking and amazing and astonishing is that we don't find that Moses, that Aaron is punished for this. Not only is he not punished, he becomes the high priest. How could he become the high priest? But And there's a lot of commentary and a lot of midrashim. And on the other hand, we find that Aaron always felt guilt for this. When, when, when he was summoned to be the high priest and Aaron was told by Moses, go like the menorah, Aaron was like, I'm not worthy because of the sin of the golden calf. And we also find in Deuteronomy, when Moses talks about the story, he repeats everything that occurred. He tells us something new we didn't know. And that was, he says, at the time of the golden calf, God was angry at Aaron as well. And I had to plead for forgiveness, not just for the Jewish people, but for my brother Aaron. But yet Aaron seems to ultimately not be punished for this. And not only not be punished, but goes on to become the high priest. So there's a lot of defenses given for Aaron's involvement in the golden calf. The first and most famous one is brought down in the Zohar is that Aaron was stalling for time. In other words, he knew Moses was going to come back down. He saw the people were getting crazy. They were getting frenzied. They were getting panicky. They were getting hot-headed. And the Midrashim even goes so far to say that it says when Moses went up, he appointed Aaron and Hur. Hur was his nephew to be in charge. They were the same ones that went up on the mountain to hold Moses' hands up during the war against Amalek. So he's, and when Hur tried to object, they lynched him and they killed him. And Aaron said, okay, they're going to kill me too. I have to play along. And so what did he do? He stalled. And we all could relate to this, right? Sometimes when a person is faced with a challenge, there's two ways to deal with it. One way is take it head on, confront the problem and deal with it directly. Another way is let me buy some time. Now, people call it kick the can down the road, but it's more than kick the can down the road. Kick the can down the road is let somebody else worry about it. Stall for time is like, okay, let me buy some time because time will help solve the problem. If I could postpone, if I could delay, the problem will resolve itself. So rather than fight about it now, let me... And that was his, Aaron's thinking. Now, where did his calculation go wrong? He figured that he told the man, okay, go home, get the jewelry from your wives, bring it back, we'll make a golden calf. He thought they could go, they go to their wives and the wives said, I'm not giving up my jewelry. I'm not giving up my necklaces and my rings and my bracelets. No way. And then there would be a negotiation between the husbands and wives. By the time they get the jewelry from their wives, convince their wives or negotiate with their wives, Moses will be back and it'll all be over. What went wrong? What backfired? They didn't go discuss it with their... They were so frenzied and, and, and hot-headed and fanatical about this, that they ripped the jewelry off their wives. It says, they just took it by force. So they were back right away with the jewelry. So most, Aaron's plan didn't work. But he meant well. That was the first, That's another 
um, way. Another thing is because he saw that Hor was killed. He said, look what happened to my nephew. He tried to object and it didn't work either. So there are different defenses given for, for Aaron. Also, you have to realize that at first, it wasn't supposed to be a god. It was supposed to be a substitute for Moses, the leader. They were trying to substitute Moses is not coming. Let's get a new leader. Then some of the people went further and said, this is the God who took us out of Egypt. But initially they said, we need a new leader who's going to lead us to the land of Israel. Let this calf be the leader who will take us to the land of Israel. God will rest his divine presence, like through the cherubim, for example. But then they took it to the next level. But when Aaron was approached, it wasn't to make a God. It was just to make a leader. There's no law of idolatry that you can't replace a leader, a human being, with a golden calf. But then they said, this is the God that took us out of Egypt. And they took it to a uh, the, the, the next level of idolatry. But what emerges from all of this, and this is more of a overall uh, um, over writing and overarching idea that Moses and Aaron had two different personalities. You know, we all know what it says in Pirkei Avot. What is Aaron known for? Be from the disciples of Aaron. Love peace, pursue peace, love mankind, and draw them closer to the Torah. In other words, Aaron was a peacemaker. Okay? Moses was the lawgiver. So think about a diplomat, right? A diplomat, a politician, a foreign minister. His art is the art of diplomacy. Diplomacy is finding a way to bring people together. And to do that, you have to sometimes uh, bend the truth a little bit. You have to sometimes um, massage the truth a little bit. Maybe not overt lies, but... But but you have to be able to be, as they say, diplomatic. Now think about a Supreme Court judge. The Supreme Court judge is not there to make peace amongst people. They're there to interpret the law. This is the law, and that's it. It's the law. Now, Moses and Aaron, and we find many passages that says, uh, Moses was the man of truth. We all know, we talk about Moshe Emet, Moses is truth, and his Torah is truth. Truth is blind, right? Doesn't matter who the parties are, doesn't matter what the circumstances are. This is the truth. This is the reality. This is the MS, as they say, right? Justice, truth. But Aaron was the man of peace, the peacemaker. Now, truth is truth. But when, when when you go with absolute truth, there's right and wrong. There's a winner and a loser. Uh, innocent party and a guilty party. And that isn't always a good, it may be the truth, but it doesn't always result in peace. Because the person who lost is very unhappy. Because you told them the truth. So we all do this on a daily basis. We have to sometimes say, okay, if I need to keep people together, right, I don't want the relationships to fall apart. What do I have to say to keep everything together? And I sometimes have to go a little soft on the truth, or I have to like overlook it a little bit or glance over it a little bit or not emphasize it as much, right? And that's diplomacy. Diplomacy is not only amongst countries. Diplomacy is in your own family sometimes. Diplomacy is sometimes in your workplace. Diplomacy is with your friends, right? So it's a lengthy subject, but what the Torah is saying is there's no one model of leadership. There's a Moses and an Aaron. Moses has his strengths. He's the lawgiver. The law never changes. It's absolute. It's concrete. It's definite. Peacemaking needs a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of compromise. And sometimes a person could feel like, well, I want to be truthful. I want to be honest. I want to say it as it is. Speak your truth. But Judaism would say no. There's a consequence to speaking your truth sometimes. And it doesn't mean you should lie, but sometimes you don't have to like speak. You know, I always joke when people say, well, you want me to be brutally honest with you? And you're like, no, thank you very much. Don't be brutally honest with me. In other words, you have to take into account 
how the person is going to receive what you're saying. What's the point of saying the truth if the person is not going to hear you? They're going to reject you. They're not going to be able to, they don't have the ability. So if you know somebody can handle the truth, they want to know the truth, you tell them the truth because, right? And sometimes you have to tell the truth. There's no way around it. But sometimes, you know, this person is not ready to hear the whole truth. There's an old joke about this rabbi who was in a courtroom, or really as a Sylvan who was being interrogated. And so they asked him to raise his hand and uh, they, they swore. And then they took his testimony and the the lawyer who's using him as a reference said, is it true that you're one of the leading rabbis in America? He said, I'm actually most probably the leading rabbi in America and Canada, he said. He said, is it true that you're one of the leading uh, Torah scholars, Talmudic scholars? I'm probably the most, you know, leading uh, Torah Talmudic scholar. So the judge turns over to him. He says, excuse me, uh, Rabbi, you mind if I ask you a question? He says, doesn't your religion say anything about um, humility? And the rabbi says, it does, Your Honor, but I'm under oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? There's the truth, there's the whole truth, and there's nothing but the truth, right? Sometimes you don't have to tell the whole truth, right? If somebody comes to me, uh, they want to start keeping Judaism. I tell them all well, 613 commandments on day one, it's not going to work. So, you know, why don't you try doing this mitzvah? You know, why don't you do this mitzvah? And you slowly, you don't tell them the whole truth right away, so to speak. Okay. So it's true in all areas of life. So the message is that you need a Moses and you need an Aaron and you need collaboration between the two of them. Someone asked a question on the chat and I always welcome questions on the chat. And that is, why a calf? Why a golden calf? What's the business with the calf? And the answer is that that was the idolatry they were familiar with in Egypt. In Egypt, that's what they worshipped. And therefore, they reverted to their, you know, when people sometimes uh, are, you know, break an addiction and then they have a relapse, right? They go back to what they're familiar with, what they know, you know, in a time of distress. That's the human nature. So you could break out of something, but then you under pressure or stress or whatever it is, and you revert to your old practices and behaviors. Now that the Jews felt threatened and lost and confused because Moses wasn't coming down, they went back to the form of worship or leadership in, 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 in Egypt, sort of like in India, they worshiped animals and the calf was one of those idols. Going back to uh, the story of Moses and Aaron, one of the things that happens after the story of the golden calf is after they receive forgiveness, and I told you about the 13 attributes of divine mercy, and the day that Moses comes down with the second set of tablets was Yom Kippur, which becomes a permanent day of forgiveness. There's a lot of interesting conversations between Moses and God. One, for example, is God's, God says, Moses says to God, uh, Moses says to God, Show me your ways. Teach me your ways so I can find favor in your eyes. That's one request. And then Moses says to God, we want you to lead us to the land of Israel. That's the second request. And then the ultimate request is when Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says, nobody could see my face. You could only see my back and live. It's fascinating, these conversations. And then a fascinating thing that God says is God says, there is a place Near me, you may stand on the rock. When my glory passes by, I shall place you in the cleft of the rock. I'm sure you've heard this verse. I will shield you with my hand until I have passed. Then I shall remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face may not be seen. Now, we have about five minutes left to this class, and you could imagine how deep these ideas are. Show me your face. Show me your glory. You shall lead us with your face to the land of Israel. And God says, no, nobody can see my face. You can only see my back. I will shield you in the cleft of the rock. And I will shield you with my hand until I have passed. What is going on? What is the meaning of this? And why are these conversations happening between Moses and God right now? 
And as you can imagine, there's a lot of spiritual depth and meaning to all of this with a lot of interpretation and commentary. But to just give you the general idea, and the idea is as follows, that, you know, the first thing was deal with the crisis. The Jews made a golden calf. We have to, you know, break the tablets to shake the Jews into awakening from their merriment and revelry around the golden calf. And then, and again, there's a lot of interpretations to that breaking of the tablets. Why would Moses break the tablets? Why not just give it back to God? But we won't go there right now. And then he grinds the calf to dust. And then he pleads for forgiveness. But then he starts saying to God, okay, God, how did we get here in the first place? We have to make sure this doesn't happen again. What do we need? And what he says is we need you to be the leader, the direct leader. In other words, instead of me being the intermediary, you, God, should show them your face. And you should lead them to the land of Israel. Now, what does this mean? So if you think about the face versus the back, right? What does face-to-face -face communication represent? Closeness. What is face-to-back communication? When I give you my back, I'm basically saying I'm distant from you. And what Moses is saying to God is, you know, the problem is, the reason they made a gold, golden calf, if we want to get now to the cause of the problem and try to, you know, understand how the Jews came to making a golden calf, he says, maybe they don't feel your closeness. You know, big miracles, power, awesomeness, 10 plagues, splitting of the sea. But they don't feel a closeness to God. God is up in the heaven, distant, and Moses is the leader, but they want to feel closer to you. And that's why they made this golden calf, something they could relate to. And therefore, Mo God says, Moses says to God, you need to step in here. As a matter of fact, one of the things Moses does believe it or not, he takes his tent and he pitches it outside of the camp, distant from the camp, okay? And the question, why would Moses move out of the camp? It's like moving out of the neighborhood. Why abandon the Jews at this point? But what Moses was saying, God, you need to step in. I, mean, I can't be the substitute for your presence. You have to show them your face. You have to show them your love. You have to be more connected to them so that they don't stray again. And basically what God's response is that they're human and they I cannot they cannot see my face. But what God says is a number of things. I will show them my glory. What does that mean to say? God says, I will shield you with my hand until I have passed. Then I shall remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. But when he says, when my glory passes by, I shall place you in the cleft of the rock. In other words... What he's saying is that you, while you can't see the face of God, God will shield you. What does that mean he will shield you? He will give you the sense of his presence, of his closeness, that you will be able to endure when you don't. A rabbi said, what does it mean, show me your ways? Let me see your face. What Moses was saying is the oldest question about God. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow human suffering and tragedy and pain and misery? If he's a good God, why does he allow all of this? Show me your face. Explain to me your ways. I want to understand your workings, your deeds in this world. And God says, you're human. You can't understand my ways. You can't see my face. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, as the prophet Isaiah says. But what I could do is give you shielding. When somebody shields you, they envelop you, you feel their love, you feel their closeness, you feel their protection, even as the glory of God is passing by. And what God is saying is that you will feel my nearness even if you can't see my face. You will feel my presence. Again, it's we can relate to all of this today, right? Can't we? So many questions about the tragedies that are befalling the Jewish people, starting with October 7th. But at the same time, we feel Hashem's closeness even more. People are getting closer to God during these times, right? So God says, you cannot understand my ways. It's beyond human comprehension. But at the same time, I will shield you with my hand as I pass by. And 
again, these are very deep ideas, and they go to the essence of theology and our faith in God. But in these verses, um, we find Moses and God discussing the most critical, essential, pivotal uh, questions about our relationship with God and how we're supposed to relate to God and how we to relate to a God that we cannot know his ways and understand why he allows tragedies and suffering. And again, like we began the Parsha, it doesn't matter if it's one person who's suffering of terminal illness or it's an entire population of people that are suffering. Every human being is a world unto themselves. And therefore we live with questions. We live with pain, but God says, unfortunately you can't see my face and not seeing my face is not a, a bad thing necessarily. It just means we're incapable of seeing the face of God. We are not God. We are, don't have divine intelligence. We don't have infinite intelligence. We're human beings with finite, limited minds and capacity. And that's what makes us human. If we had infinite intelligence and could understand God's workings, we wouldn't be human beings anymore. So in order to be a human being in a human world, we have to live with these limitations and these restrictions and confinements, but knowing at the same time that what we can't necessarily comprehend with our mind, we could grasp with our soul, with our heart. We could feel the presence and the glory of Hashem. And I'll just conclude by saying that there's another beautiful interpretation that says, God says, you cannot see my face, but you can see my back. What does that mean to say? As you're facing a problem and going through it, you can't understand it. But sometimes you could look back in hindsight, see my back and say, oh, now I can understand what that was. And sometimes in this lifetime, we don't understand it. But in the next world, we can look back at this lifetime and say, now I understand everything I have to go through in my lifetime. So that faith that we could someday see it in hindsight and retroactively understand it is what Moses is being told by God. But as you can see, there's a lot of big subjects in this week's Torah portion, very profound and deep ideas. And as much as we talk about it, it's just scratching the surface. There's thousands of years of commentary on all these stories. And the golden calf is definitely, but again, the beauty of the golden calf story is that it could be a very deep or a very simple subject. The simple application of the golden calf is only worship God. Don't worship the golden calf. What is the golden calf? Everybody could fill in the blanks. Golden calf is worshiping money, for example, or wish worshiping uh, idolizing people, right? Um, or thinking that your help is going to come through your doctor or your lawyer. Of course, your doctor and your lawyer are going to help you or whoever is going to help you in any challenge you're facing. But to put your trust in God, not in a human being. Don't, you know, golden calf is not just serving a statue. It's putting your faith in anything but God. Yes, God will send his natural ambassadors and emissaries to help you. But you have to know the source of it all, where it's coming from. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you all for joining, and we shall see you soon. See you in Shabbat, hopefully. Bye.